Hello, it's Bruce Williams, and today I would like to present part eight of my series on pathology of cattle, and today we're going to talk about the skin. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those individuals, colleagues, and friends who have provided me these images over the years, which allow me to put these lectures together. Well, let's start with the young animals, as we usually do. And this is a case of congenital lymphedema in an Ayrshire calf, which are well known for this problem. This is an autosomal dominant genetic defect involved with a deficiency of the production of a transmembrane protein on lymphatic endothelium known as podoplanin. And you get all gradations of severity of this disease. Some animals simply have extensive swelling on the head, the neck, and the lower limbs. Some animals have almost no production of podoplanin and do not form lymphatic vessels or lymph nodes. Here's a, a much worse case. Whenever the uh, animal is born without any hair, that's a, that's a sign that there are significant problems and there may be other problems in this animal. But you can see that the animal has uh, this diffuse swelling in anasarca and if you incise the uh, skin, the uh, the lymph just sort of oozes out. So that is congenital lymphedema, a problem in cattle, dogs, and pigs, and people. Here's a problem that we see in a number of species, and you can see that there are large areas in which the epithelium is missing. And this is a condition known as epitheliogenesis imperfecta. We've seen this once in this lecture series, and this is a defect a genetic defect in a protein of the hemidesmosome known as laminin-5 and it makes the hemidesmosomes which anchor the epidermis to the dermis very weak and this tissue often sloughs off during the birth process. The epidermis and the dermis are normal it's just the anchoring proteins that are deficient and you most often see this on the uh, the lower limbs but you can also see it in other areas of friction uh, including the tongue because animals uh, during gestation make sucking movements and you have friction and it will rub the epidermis right off. Let's talk about ichthyosis in cattle. There are once again several forms of ichthyosis, ichthyosis congenita being the less calm or less severe form, excuse me, and ichthyosis fetalis, also known as harlequin fetuses, being the uh, more severe form affecting more of the body. Um, ichthyosis arises from genetic defects in the epidermal cells uh, in the transport of lipid across the epidermal cell membrane. Uh, when we think about the formation of the epidermis, um, the, the more superficial layers are surrounded by lipids, which allow them to come off in uh, one and two cells at a time. It's sort of like bricks in a wall, and the mortar is this intercellular lipid, which is secreted by the cells themselves. Uh, when the cells are unable to secrete that lipid from inside the cell through the cell membrane against the concentration gradient, um, then it becomes very hard and crusty and hyperkeratosis, and we get the, uh, the disease known as ichthyosis. So here's a case of ichthyosis congenita. You can see that uh, most of the animal looks fairly normal, but we have these large, somewhat hyperkeratotic areas. Uh, over the hind limbs, some in the forelimbs, you can also see it in the, the muzzle, the abdomen, and the inguinal region. And whereas this condition is not life-threatening at this particular level, um, most of the animals are eventually euthanized because of severe bacterial contamination of the skin. You may see it with other congenital defects. Remember, uh, congenital defects often appear in, as constellations. You rarely see one, and uh, so you may also have uh, microphthalmia, cataracts, and thyroid deficiencies. For some reason, it usually affects uh, male calves, and there are a couple of uh, breeds that are well known for this, including uh, Holsteins, Kianinas, and Jersey cattle. 
Here's a, a more severely affected animal, affects the entire body. This one would fall into the area of uh, ichthyosis fetalis. These animals are usually aborted or they are moribund at presentation and they die within a couple of days. Here's another aborted fetus. Um, this fetus has large hyperkeratotic plaques, usually over the dorsum of the animal, on the head, the neck, and the back. And this is seen in association with mycotic abortion. Um, just like you would expect with a fungal lesion of the skin, it is epidermal in nature, there is marked hyperkeratosis. Don't get this confused with the presentation uh, in horses of mycotic abortion, which comes from a incompetent cervix and spreads from the cervical star. In cattle, it's, this is usually seen as a hematogenous infection, most often in winter months as a result of contamination of the feed with uh, some form of fungus. Uh, Aspergillus, uh, Mucor, Absidia, Rhizopus, Mordiorella, and a number of members of the Mucorales are incriminated. So it can be just about anything. Uh, the fungus usually spreads from the rumen or the respiratory tract to the uh, placenta. And abortion is the result of uh, the eventual necrotizing vasculitis that so often accompanies fungal infections. You can recover and culture uh, the fungal organism from uh, the placenta, the skin, or a great place to get it is from the fetal stomach contents, because remember it's probably circulating in the amniotic fluid and the animal is constantly swallowing amniotic fluid. This is a wonderful looking calf, but unfortunately it has no hair and there's a good chance it may be missing teeth or have no teeth. And this is a case of X-linked uh, ectodermal dysplasia, also known as congenital hypotrichosis and anodontia. And this very closely mimics a human condition of the same name. And the gene on the X chromosome is important in the formation of eccrine glands on the nose, so these animals don't have any eccrine glands on their nose, as well as follicle formation and the formation of tooth buds. The defective gene in both people and cattle is on the X chromosome. It is the EDA gene, and that is short for uh, ectodermal dysplasia with anhydrosis. There is, it's not life-threatening, of course, and there is sort of a wide, uh, uh, wide variation in the severity of the condition. Here's one that uh, the animal obviously has gotten to be a heifer, and it has variable degrees of hypotrichosis uh, in various parts of the body. multifocal coalescing erosive dermatitis at the coronary band and we have seen evidence of uh, bovine pestivirus infection in almost every lecture so far we're going to see a number of other conditions it's one of those viruses that causes so many different uh, things in the body and we've talked about uh, pestivirus infecting basal epithelium and so you are going to get uh, uh, erosion, ulceration in areas where you have virally infected epithelium and friction. And the area between the toes is an area that gets a lot of friction when the animal walks on its feet, it rubs together, and animals with uh, mucosal disease will often have skin lesions, and this is a very good spot to look in between the toes. This is also bovine pestivirus infection, and this is a severe lesion which results in loss of the, uh, the hoof. Uh, 
and so these animals can also uh, slough their hooves. Other things to look for is sort of a patchy hyperkeratosis around the neck, the shoulder, and the uh, uh, and the perineal areas, as we see here. So remember that uh, uh, mucosal disease doesn't just affect the GI tract, but you can see uh, erosive and ulcerative lesions in the skin as well. Another genetic defect uh, in certain types of cattle is dermatosporaxis, also known as uh, Ehlers-Danlos type 7 in humans. This is a result of a deficiency in procollagen and proteinase, and the skin is very thin, and it tends to rip uh, very easily. It looks like somebody's tried to staple this back on with a little success. Papillomaviruses uh, are fairly common in cattle. We've already looked at some that affect the GI tract, and there's actually six um, that you probably should know about. Um, bovine papillomavirus 1 and 2 cause fibropapillomas. They're also known as fibropapillomaviruses, and they cause these fairly large, almost fist size papillomas in which you have proliferation of both the epithelium and the dermal elements. So when you cut through them, you see this uh, thick dermal core. Uh, bovine papillar papillomavirus 1 uh, generally affects the perigenital areas, including the uh, uh, fibro papillomas that are seen on the penis of bulls, as well as the teats and udders of, of uh, cows. Uh, bov bovine papillomavirus type 2 affects the uh, skin of cattle as well as occasionally the alimentary tract and urinary bladder of cattle. And we've talked about the problems when you mix uh, bovine papillomavirus with bracken fern. And uh, it makes these papillomas generally go malignant and become squamous cell carcinomas. Remember bovine papillomavirus 1 and 2 are also uh, the causative agents for equine sarcoids when they uh, jump species and they're traumatically inoculated into the skin of, uh, of horses. Okay, um, bovine papillomavirus uh, 3, 4, and 6 are epitheliotropic, so they don't usually give you these big fibropapillomas. They tend to be uh, much more concentrated on what's going on in the uh, epidermis. Uh, bovine papillomavirus 3 infects the skin. Bovine papillomavirus 4 infects the upper alimentary tract, especially the esophagus. Um, and looks like little, uh, I always thought they looked like little artist paintbrushes. They sort of have a, a, a very thin, wispy end to them. And uh, bovine papillomavirus 6 affects the uh, teats and other udders. Um, it's a very prevalent virus. Up to 50% of cattle will have had or have a papillomavirus, uh, clinical papillomavirus infection. So extremely common. They do spontaneously regress, most of them due to the animal's uh, immune response. So they may last for a month to uh, over a year. Okay, let's not confuse this emerging disease with uh, papillomavirus infection. This is a disease that is becoming worse and worse. This is known as lumpy skin disease. And when the skin is haired uh, in the early stages of disease, as we see in this young calf, um, it can resemble uh, fibropapillomas, but instead of that warty appearance, they tend to have a necrotic center. This is lumpy skin disease, a result of uh, infection of cattle by caprapox, um, or the agent that causes goat pox, and it causes a severe systemic reaction. Here we're looking at the uh, uh, we're looking at the typical pox lesions with a necrotic core, proliferative. Uh, rim, um, but we can also see this in uh, a number of other organs. Animals often uh, result, uh, have severe pneumonia and anorexia. These uh, lesions will 
not only uh, ruin the hide, but they are also can often contaminated with uh, uh, bacterial infections or screwworm infections. You can occasionally see uh, conjunctivitis and keratitis and mucopurial and discharge from the mouth and nostrils. So it can be a, a very difficult problem. And one of the characteristic lesions that is seen with this particular condition is the chronic lesion that is seen in, uh, in the skin. And these nodules will eventually become totally necrotic in the center, and they will uh, separate from the surrounding skin and fall off, resulting in these large ulcerative lesions known as sit fasts. So you can tell that this is going to be a hide that's not going to be useful for, uh, for very much. Okay, great picture from Dr. Derek Mosier, and we are looking at the, uh, obviously, the distal limbs of a cow, and there has been uh, marked separation. All of this tissue distal to this area here is uh, necrotic. Uh, the skin is dead, the dermis is dead, soft tissue is dead. It might even go down uh, close to the bone. And this, is, uh, this can be a number of things, but the common denominator is um, that the animal got into some type of uh, uh, feed that has, contains ergot alkaloids. Ergot alkaloids, especially ergonovaline, are agonists for dopamine receptors, which cause a number of issues, including marked peripheral vasoconstriction. Uh, this necrosis may be seen on the forelimbs and may be seen on the other extremities, including the ears, uh, the tail, and sometimes the, uh, the teats. And affected animals that don't get this bad will show uh, a loss of body weight, rough coat, arch back, um, may result in uh, agalactia as well. There are two... Uh, uh, two agents that you should be familiar with when we talk about ergot alkaloids. One is uh, claviceps purpurea, um, which is a parasite on rye grass. And uh, uh, the sclerotia of claviceps are usually seen in the late summer when the uh, seed heads of the grass mature. The other uh, agent of this is a uh, parasite of fescue grass known as Neotyphodium cenophalium. It used to be Acrimonium cenophalium. I know a lot of people will look at these uh, Im this image and say, well, it's frostbite. And uh, cattle are pretty hardy animals. Uh, frostbite is not that common in adult animals. Maybe you might see it in calves or something. So I think in this particular case, I would probably default to uh, ergot alkaloid uh, intoxication rather than frostbite. And this can get really bad. Here's an animal that obviously was walking around on this cold, sort of dead blackish foot and eventually just gave way. And, and that's not a, uh, certainly not a good outcome. Let's talk for just a minute about uh, uh, foot rot. Whenever we talk about foot rot, um, there's a couple of common denominators, whether we're talking about pigs or, or cattle or sheep, and one of them is uh, Fusobacterium necrophorum. Fusobacterium necrophorum, as we said, is a common commensal of the GI tract of cattle. It's present in every, uh, uh, every fecal uh, plop that is deposited by a cow, so it's always in the environment. And when a, uh, an animal is in uh, bad, wet areas, the skin will get macerated, and it's just a great place for Fusobacterium and other anaerobes to get in and to set up shop. These bacteria, in addition to Fusobacterium, uh, that cause foot rot in cattle, change names on a regular basis and very difficult to keep up with. Uh, Porphyromonas and Prevotella and Dichylobacter nodosus are uh, um, other anaerobes that you might hear in association with uh, 
uh, fusobacterium in cases of foot rot. Foot rot almost always starts uh, once again between the toes. Um, and it usually in cattle will affect uh, one foot. Um, the problem with foot rot in cattle is that it is painful. The animals will not convert feed properly or they may uh, go off milk or something like that. So it is a significant economic problem uh, in many herds. About 40% of cases seem to be associated with recent calving as well. So that may be a predisposing factor. Another case of foot rot um, with abscessation and there is a draining tract to the outside of the claw. And occasionally you'll hear something called malignant foot rot uh, in cattle. And that is uh, that one pops up very, very quickly, even in very good uh, uh, hus areas of husbandry because it is hematogenous. So just remember that, occasionally see that. Okay, this is a classic lesion in ruminants, especially those that are, that are um, in poor husbandry areas. It's known as uh, uh, rain scald, cutaneous streptothrachosis, um, but it is infection of the epidermis and dermis due to dermatophilus congolensis or cutaneous dermatophilosis. And uh, one of the characteristics is this sort of serum crusting oozing which causes the hair to stick together and, and go every which way like uh, sort of like paintbrushes again um, we tend to think of this not as a severe disease but especially young animals um, if over half of their bodies cover with this um, may die from this it's often associated with ticks and suckling calves may have lesions on the uh, on the face as well. Dermatophilus is minimally invasive in the intact epidermis, so you sh usually have to have some combination of skin damage, that's where ticks may come into play, and prolonged moisture. Um, this prolonged moisture is needed for activation of the environmentally resistant coccoid bodies of dermatophilosis to uh, become the motile zoospores which characterize the infection. Here's another case of a dermatophilosis in an older animal. It's a little more regional here. And a, a nice picture, a nice cross section of this where you can see um, the epidermis, this tremendous uh, uh, agglomeration of serum, uh, purulent inflammation, as well as the bacteria, which just sort of sticks all of the hair together. Something that you'll see uh, more commonly in uh, colder weather when animals are congregated together is ringworm. Uh, Trichophyton varicosum is the most common in uh, cattle, then uh, Trichophyton menagrophytes, maybe Trichophyton equinum. But it's usually associated with crowding and confinement, and, and young animals often have lesions around the, the hair where the halter goes. And uh, in areas where there, this is a severe problem, there's actually a vaccine available, but it's not a life-threatening condition. You have the typical alopecic hyperkeratotic plaques. Uh, in addition to the head and the neck, you can see it on the chest. Uh, and the limbs most often. Don't confuse ringworm with this reportable disease, which is probably the uh, worst form of mange in cattle. And this is known as cattle scab or Seroptes bovis. In, in, most, con in most countries, it's a reportable disease. And uh, these particular agents. They don't burrow like sarcoptes. They complete their life cycle on the skin surface. 
but the lesions that are associated with cattle scab and the pruritus and the inflammation can actually be lethal in young animals. You know that mange is really bad when you get a, a uh, uh, systemic reaction. These animals become neutropenic and lymphopenic. It starts at the uh, base of the tail or the pole or withers and uh, often is, uh, is eventually contaminated with secondary bacterial infections. The agent probably induces a chronic hypersensitivity, so the lesions will have a lot of lymphocytes and eosinophils and mast cells. And the calves that are severely affected will develop, uh, as we said before, lymphopenia, anemia, and neutropenia. So this is cattle scab. There is a, uh, a similar condition, not as bad, um, caused by Coreoptes bovis also known as leg mange. You see it in house dairy cows in the winter. There is some pruritus and it usually uh, pops up over the tail head. You want to rule out the possibility of, of uh, cattle scab. Um, this doesn't cause any systemic problems. It may cause uh, um, some drop in milk production. And you can also see this on the feet as well. So this is Coreoptic mange or Coreoptes bovis. One more type of mange, not as common, but this is sarcoptic mange. Uh, 350 different types and, and growing of mammals uh, will get sarcoptes. So you can see that not as common a problem as it is in other production animals like pigs, but uh, in cattle just as well as any other species, this is highly contagious uh, and intensely pruritic. And in many countries is also a reportable disease because of the uh, similarities that it has to, uh, to cattle scab. Okay, another emerging disease which is uh, uh, increasing in prevalence in southern Europe is besnoidiosis. of heel flies, also known as gad flies. And they have a very interesting life cycle. Um, these gad flies, cattle know about them, they have a very pronounced buzz, at least hypoderma bovis does. And uh, they tend to run away from these flies. But the flies will uh, lay their eggs on the limbs of cattle. And then the, the larva, when they hatch, will penetrate directly into the skin of the legs, which results in a somewhat pruritic lesion right there. The larvae continue to, to uh, migrate along fascial planes, um, and they leave this sort of uh, greenish track, um, which is probably a combination of, of uh, tissue fluid and eosinophils, and uh, it's known as butcher's jelly. But uh, what they do is they migrate to a place where they will overwinter. And uh, uh, hypoderma bovis overwinters in the epidural fat, and uh, hypoderma lineatum overwinters in the esophageal submucosa. And then in the springtime, they will both migrate to the, uh, uh, to the uh, subcutaneous tissue of the back, where they will insist they will form a hole where they can breathe through the, through the spiracles in their hind end, and eventually they will pupate, fall out, and uh, uh, on the ground they will uh, uh, become the adult flies. Um, there are a number of other problems that are associated with uh, hypodermisis besides simply ruining the hide. The hide will be full of holes, but because they do migrate in the epidural fat, aberrant migration of hypoderma bovis might result in uh, neurologic disease, And rarely, if these parasites, while in the, uh, the subcutaneous tissue of the back, are uh, crushed, then they can result in anaphylaxis uh, syndrome in, and 
sudden death in cattle. So it's a real problem. While we're talking about parasites in the skin of cattle, here's one from uh, uh, from the U.S., the southern U.S., and we're looking at the underside of the cow, probably near the umbilicus, and there are these large plaques of uh, uh, very thickened allopectic hyperpigmented skin, and this is the result of inf chronic infection with Stephanofilaria styles eye, which is transmitted by horn flies. The adults live in the hair follicles uh, or in the dermis, and uh, you can see microfilaria in, uh, within the skin. The horn fly will bite. The, uh, uh, the animal will go ahead and take some of the uh, larva up into, and they will mature in the horn fly. Then they will eventually be redeposited in, an, in a number of other animals. This is a chronic healed lesion. Um, the acute lesions where the animals are, you know, continually feeding on them are sort of a, a weepy, uh, painful lesion. When we talk about horn flies, horn flies in themselves are not uh, uh, without significant problems. This may be one of the uh, most economically important pests in the beef cattle industry throughout the United States and causes annual losses of many, many millions of dollars in lost weight gain because they're just really, really annoying to the, uh, uh, to the animals. Uh, each horn fly will take between 24 to 38 blood meals per day and 10 microliters of blood per feeding. So you can imagine how irritated the animals will get in areas where horn fly control is poor. Here's a fantastic picture by Dr. Eleonora Morell, and you can see here that the uh, that the hair has a, a discolored area. This is uh, a change in the hair coat, and also the hair itself is is really um, sort of frizzy and and poorly formed. This is the appearance of an animal with copper deficiency. Um, in addition to this, you'll see a number of other changes, including decreased weight gain and, and uh, anemia and lameness and diarrhea. But since we're talking about the skin, remember that uh, copper is required for the auto-oxidation of self-hydro groups. Um, these are copper-dependent, and they're required not only for keratin cross-linking, so when you don't have copper, you get poor cross-linking of the keratin, but also uh, tyrosinase uh, is a copper-dependent enzyme, so you get hyperpigmentation. And in ruminants, one of the early places that you will see hypopigmentation is around the eyes, giving rise to what is known as spectacle formation in affected animals. Well, here's another picture of a lesion around the eye, and, and this is a white animal, and we have a loss of, of hair, irritation of the skin. This is photosensitization. We've talked about photosensitization when we covered the liver. Just remember there are uh, three main types of photosensitization. Uh, the first is primary, type 1, which is the ingestion of preformed photodynamic toxins like uh, St. John's wort or phenothiazine or tetracycline. Um, type 2 is probably the least common. It is um, a congenital enzyme deficiency in certain animals, um, a defect in uroporphyrogen 3 cosynthetase. And the third one is probably the widest uh, range most commonly seen, and that is hepatogenous photosensitization. And it's the result of damage to the liver and the inability to uh, convert uh, chlorophyll properly. And you get a, uh, a substance which will circulate in the blood, known as phyloerythrin, and when it gets into lightly pigmented or lightly haired area, um, it is excited by... Uh, the presence of UV light and causes damage to that area of the skin. So that's type three. There is a type four, um, and those are unknown. So eventually, uh, when when the uh, mechanism is is figured out, it'll be moved into one of the other categories. But uh, this is uh, photosensitization. Look for it in 
sparsely pigmented white areas on cattle. Here's an absolutely fantastic picture in which the, uh, uh, the dermatitis and ulceration is restricted to the white areas on this uh, Holstein cow, and this is a, a grain of, uh, uh, from Pithomyces chartarum, the cause of, of spore desmond toxicosis. I threw this in, a picture from my friend Helen Ackland, and this is from a downer cow. This is from the front end, the animal was down, and this is sort of a, a chronic degeneration of the dermis known as putty brisket. And I just like the term putty brisket, but it's very descriptive of what you can see in some of these downer cows. Well, let's finish up with a couple of tumors. Uh, here is a, a pigmented neoplasm, uh, which is a melanocytoma, and these are not uncommon uh, benign tumors in, uh, uh, in certain breeds of cattle. Melanoma is not a common uh, one. We will talk eventually about squamous cell carcinoma when we get to the special senses because it is a real problem in and around the eyes of cattle but squamous cell carcinoma is a very common uh, tumor that arises in the skin of cattle, the lightly pigmented areas, especially in animals that are kept at uh, high altitudes. And then the last one that we'll talk about is uh, cutaneous lymphoma. Cutaneous lymphoma is one of the uh, few sporadic forms of lymphoma which is not caused by infection by bovine leukemia virus. And just a picture flipped over of the nodules associated with, uh, uh, with cutaneous lymphoma in cattle. Okay, well that concludes this particular lecture. Uh, when we come back, the next lecture will cover the musculoskeletal system of cattle, and I hope that you'll come back for that one. I hope that uh, you enjoyed this lecture, and everybody has a great day.